Welcome to worship here at Central Baptist Church. I would like to make one announcement before we begin our worship today. I'm sorry to say that Blair Morgan is ill this morning, so she won't be opening with an intro today. We will reschedule her, and hopefully she will be better soon, and uh, we do welcome you today. <clears throat> Join me in our call to worship printed in your order of service. <coughs> Come, worship and praise God together. For God's praise and glory of our praise. Tell stories of God's power in the lives of God's children, God's mighty acts throughout history. For God's praise and glory of our praise. Remember the compassion God has shown toward us. God's mercy and unfailing love, generation after generation. Remember the gift of the Holy Spirit empowering us to do great things in God's name. For God's grace and worthy of our grace. Pass these stories along to our children and grandchildren so that they too may come to know and love God. For God's grace and worthy of our grace. It's my pleasure to welcome you to worship here at Central Baptist Church this morning on this Father's Day weekend. It is uh, always a time where we celebrate our fathers, and for some, that is easier than others. We recognize that some of us approach this day with gladness, and the joy that we, we feel towards our fathers and others. It is a time of less than gladness either because those fathers are now absent from us. But the one thing that we hold secure is that we have been adopted as sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father, and we celebrate that today in this service of worship. 
of, of our God. And I remind you of our meditation printed at the top of your order of worship. Grant us calm. Remove our needless armor because we remember, O oh God, that you are our stronghold. Let us worship together. <coughs> But the Lord was my support. 
He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because, because he delighted in me. Therefore, Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. May I have the boys and girls join me in the front? Good morning, good morning. Man, is it good to see all of your faces today. Have you all told your dad Happy Father's Day? Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, I have something in this little pouch that's going to help us uh, with our lesson today. I'm going to show you what it is real quick. It's five smooth stones, okay? Five smooth stones. They are. They're stones, rocks, yep. So you pro and these rocks remind me of a story in the Bible about a man, two men, named David and Goliath. Have y'all ever heard that story before? Okay, if you haven't, then I'm going to give you a little preview, okay? You've not heard about it? Okay. Well, Goliath was a giant, and not only was he super tall, but he wore strong armor over his whole body, and he had a sword and a spear, and his armor was very heavy, and he was a big warrior. And then there was David. Y'all may have heard about him in the Bible, because he's a shepherd. Have you ever heard about David the shepherd? Yes. Yeah. So he's a young boy, and he has no armor. The armor is too heavy for him, so he can't wear it. He has no sword and no spear. David's weapon is a slingshot. Have you ever seen a slingshot? Um, yes, I have. Yes, yeah. I know what they are, but no, I have. And I think it was not just like, like you put a rock in it and like you shoot it. You got it. It, it was like, like, like a, yellow, a little brown, like, thing. Where you, like you spin it around and then oh, you yeah. Go. Okay. So then he uses five, or he uses step, one stone, actually. But he collects some stones at the river on his way. To defeat Goliath. And did you know that he was able to do it? A young boy was able to defeat a giant with a slingshot and one stone. Did that take courage? Yes. Do you think that you would have that kind of courage? Yes. You would go up against the giant? No. Like a slingshot. So we might not actually ever have to face a giant. I hope we don't. No. But we might face other things in our life that make us scared. Maybe when we're shy or we're lonely or we don't feel like we're good enough for something or, or anything else that might make us scared. But I wanted to show you five things, and I'm going to use these, sh these stones, that will help us remember what to do when we're scared. Okay? We're going to be courageous like David. Okay? David said to Saul, I will go and fight the Philistine. He, was, he said, don't worry, I got this. So he was very courageous. So you can be courageous when you have something that you have to deal with in your life. The second stone represents a, um, the word confidence. Do you think that David was confident? Yes. Yes. yes, he was. He said, the Lord who saved me from the lion and the bear will save me from the Philistine. He had confidence. And he went out there and just defeated him. The third stone rep represents preparation. Did David go out there with nothing? No. No. He went and he got a stone and he got his slingshot and he was prepared. So you can be prepared. The fourth stone represents trust. David didn't trust his own ability to do it. He said, when Goliath shouted at David, he said this, You come to me with your sword and your spear, but I come to you with the Lord God Almighty. So who was he trusting in? God. God. And the fifth stone represents victory. It's God's battle, not ours. So when we trust in God, we win our battles most of the time. Okay? We have to have full trust in God to be victorious. So the next time we're facing something in our life that's like a giant that makes us scared, or like courage, a or a tornado. Yes, that's a good one. Because sometimes, since that happened, we might get a little afraid of the storms these days, right? I was afraid of 
All right, so when we finish here and y'all go out there, y'all can tell somebody who, what all y'all are afraid of and how to, and then you tell them downstairs, courage, confidence, preparation, trust, and victory is how you overcome that. You're scared of the dark? Well, you have to remember to trust in God. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, just as you gave David the victory in his battle with Goliath, we know that when we put our trust in you, you will give us victory over giants we face in our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our gospel lesson today is found in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, and just as he was in the boat, there were also other boats with him. And a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped, and Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him, and they said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified, and they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, our faith in your power and your providence is strengthened today in our reflection upon the experience of David and his account, encounter with the giant Goliath. You remind us that there is nothing in all creation that is more powerful than your word. By it, Jesus calmed the storm. By it, Jesus healed and made people whole. By your word, Lord, we too are sustained by his grace. Help us to cling to your living word, to root ourselves in it, to relinquish control, placing our trust in you. Lord, we know the worst storms are the ones caused by our fear, when we grow afraid of losing our power, or we grow suspicious of the power of others, when we refuse to acknowledge your mysterious authority. Let us, yet it's often in the storm that we find our ability to have courage in releasing our weak claim to power and opening our hearts to you we discover a new way of seeing ourselves as people called to have the courage to love one another as people called to have the courage to spread your word as people called to have the courage to be who you created us to be as people called to have the courage to simply be loved by you. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into
ago now in a sermon preached from this very pulpit, Dr. Steve Cochran talked about growing up playing church league youth basketball. Church league basketball was a big part of my teenage growing up in church too. And one of the perennial problems for youth and children's ministries everywhere, though since time immemorial, has always been finding enough volunteers to staff all of the ministries of the church and our church league basketball team when I was growing up was no exception to that problem. When we first started uh, the team, our coach was a kid who had graduated from the youth group just a couple years before, maybe a sophomore in, in college. He was okay, of course, but he wasn't really old enough to be a, a youth league basketball coach. Uh, but no one else was stepping up to the challenge, so he was who we had. After a year or two of that, it became obvious that we needed somebody different, but there wasn't exactly a line of people out the door lining up for the responsibility. So we weren't sure if we were going to have a coach for the next season, and no coach, no team, right? So for a while there, we didn't really know what we were going to do, and then our youth minister told us one day, I found a coach for the basketball team, and we were all excited. Who is it? Who is it? We asked. Stuart von Herbulus, he said. 
Stuart von who, we said? <laughs> Stuart von what? <laughs> Stuart von Herbulus, he said. Y'all probably don't know him. He doesn't come to church very much. You'd recognize his wife and daughters, though. He's, he's got two daughters, preschool, elementary school age, and his wife volunteers some in the, in the children's ministry. They're here most Sundays. They sit on the left-hand side about halfway back in the, in the sanctuary. You'd recognize them. So we scheduled the first practice of the season, and when Stuart von Herbulus walked through the door, most of us had never laid eyes on the man before. We didn't have a gym to practice in at our church. We, we practiced in the fellowship hall. The fellowship hall had an, an arched ceiling that was plenty high enough in the middle to play basketball in. But when you got out toward the edges of the room, the ceiling started to get pretty low. So if you were shooting from the wing or out at the edge along the baseline, you didn't want to put too much arc on your shot or you'd hit the ceiling. <laughs> our fellowship hall, we called it Bryant Hall, was where we ate Wednesday night meals and had all the social functions of, of the church, and it had a big stage on one end, and the one basketball goal in that room was mounted against the back wall on the stage end on a, a big, heavy pipe frame that, that swung out from the wall and, and had the basketball goal swung just right in place when you were, when you were using it. The, the backboard and the rim, when it was swung out, lined up almost evenly with the waist-high front of that stage that came out from the wall. So when you played basketball, you spent the whole day literally banging your shins against that knee-high wall on the front of the stage as you were playing. We had a few practices each year before the season started, and then we would have one practice a week and one game a week. And you had to be at church on Wednesday night for church youth group, too, if you wanted to play on the basketball team. <laughs> None of us knew who Stuart Von Herbulus was that first Tuesday afternoon in Bryant Hall. He didn't know any of us either. He wasn't real comfortable at church. He'd never coached anyone in anything. <laughs> but he walked in the door, said, call me Coach V. And we did. He was our basketball coach at church for the next five years. <laughs> Scripture text this morning is from 1 Samuel chapter 17. Katie talks to our kids about it already. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to know this story. You don't even have to be a church attending Christian to know this story. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. When someone refers to David and Goliath, we all know immediately what they're referencing, an underdog story. Last week in worship, we talked about David being left out of the lineup of Jesse's sons. As Jesse's sons were gathered in front of Samuel while Samuel was choosing the next king of Israel. Just one chapter later, later, 1 Samuel 17, David is left out again. Jesse's three oldest sons have, have left the farm to join Saul's army in Saul's ongoing battle with the Philistines. But David isn't cut out for war. Maybe David's too young. Maybe he's just not well suited to battle. In any event, David's job is to make trips back and forth from the from the family farm to the front lines to keep his older brothers well supplied with food. And while he's doing this, back and forth, back and forth, the battle grinds to a halt. The Philistines have a giant named Goliath. He's eight feet tall, a mountain of a warrior who nobody wants to face. And the Philistines have issued a challenge. Our armies, they say, are at a stalemate. Let's each choose one man from among our ranks to do individual combat, and we'll settle the battle that way. So for 40 days, Goliath had walked out in front of the Philistine lines and shouted across the valley his challenge to the Israelites, Isn't even one of you man enough to fight me? And for 40 days, Israel had failed to send a man forward. You think it's hard to get someone to volunteer to coach your church league basketball team? <laughs> Try getting someone to volunteer for hand-to-hand -hand combat against the giant. <laughs> Starting to get embarrassing, though. Central, we like to think of ourselves as a church that's 
large enough and committed enough to get people to teach Sunday school when we need Sunday school teachers or to volunteer for VBS when we need volunteers for VBS. It'd be embarrassing to think that a, a church like ours and people as committed as ours are would struggle to find volunteers, right? Well, for Israel, it was embarrassing too. No one stepping forward. A proud nation, a strong people, a mighty army, God's protection, everything on their side. Surely they could find at least one volunteer, but for 40 days, nothing. No one. Finally, David who's running back and forth, back and forth, supplying his brothers. Finally, David speaks up. Who is this man who defies God's army? And why has no one stepped up to the challenge? I'll do it, he says. You can't do it, David. You're just a boy. He's a giant. I'll do it. David says, well, if you're going to do it, at least wear the king's armor. You'll need some protection. The armor doesn't fit me. It's too heavy. Can't move. I don't like it. I don't need it. You're just going to go out there with your sling? Pretty good with my sling. So Goliath, with armor and sword and shield and spear, is confronted by a shepherd, a boy. Nothing but a tunic and a slingshot. Five smooth stones he picked up from the creek as he marched out to face the giant. And David says, in the name of the Lord Almighty, I will defeat you today and the whole world will know that God is the God of of Israel. And David kills the giant. It wasn't even close. It was no contest. David kills the giant with his first stone. And he takes the giant's own sword and cuts Goliath's head off and carries it back as a trophy to the army of Israel. King Saul sees this. He looks to his advisor next to him. He says, who is that boy? Saul's advisor looks at him and says, I have no idea. <laughs> In the end, it isn't about who we are, is it? It's about who God is as God is working through us. We don't need to go out into the world wearing someone else's armor. Sometimes the very best thing you can be is yourself, the person God created you to be. David's story reminds us of that. David's story reminds us, too, that God is powerful and that God is powerfully at work in us. In our New Testament lesson, we're reminded of God's power, too. Jesus and the disciples are caught out in a boat in the middle of a storm that's getting worse and worse. Finally, the wind and the waves get so bad and so big and so powerful that everyone on board is afraid for their lives until the disciples look at Jesus and say, Jesus, aren't you going to do something? Jesus says, peace, be still. And the storm is still. The disciples are astonished all over again at the power of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Who is this man, they say, that even the wind and the waves obey him? What is this power and where does it come from? <clears throat> Andy Crouch is a Christian thinker and author. He, he dedicated an entire book to the idea of reclaiming power in the life of the ordinary Christian. He says we've all gotten so used to thinking of power as ultimately corrosive and destructive that in Christian circles we started to think of power and especially the pursuit of power as a dirty word. God's power, Crouch says, is something different. It's the power to say peace in the middle of life's storms. 
It's the power to do more than you think you can with less than you think you need, like David. You know, we tend to overestimate what we can do on our own and consistently underestimate what we can do with God working through us. There's great power in letting God work through you by simply being the person God created you to be. Craig Barnes is a preacher and professor. He's the president of Princeton Seminary. He says in his different teaching roles over the decades, he's had the opportunity to attend in person dozens and dozens of commencement speeches at various graduations. And he says all of the commencement speeches boil down to the basic same idea. You can be anything you want to be. He says he started to wince every time he hears it. Not, he says, because it isn't true. Maybe that is true. Maybe you can be anything you want to be. He winces, he says, because he's not sure anymore that it's good advice. You can be anything you want to be. Well, maybe. But the only proper thing you can be is the person God is creating you to be. The only proper thing you can do is to learn what it is to be yourself. We bring our talents with us, however inadequate they may be to life's challenges, and God does the rest. So, do we really think we can make a difference? We're seeking at Central Baptist Church to be thriving Christians this summer, right here in Noonan, Georgia, in the summer of 2021, and to be thriving Christians in a way that has an impact on our community. Do we think we? Can make a difference? Can a boy really stand in for an entire army? Can a shepherd take down a giant? Can a single word still a violent storm? We had no idea who Stuart von Herbulus was when he stood out in front of us that first day at practice. And I can promise you he had taken on a bigger challenge in us than he was ready for and with less than he felt like he needed. <laughs> but he did it anyway. And for five winters, he showed up every Tuesday afternoon to coach a ragtag group of boys in a fellowship hall that was just barely adequate to serve as a gym. He showed up every Thursday evening to coach us in our games. And because we had to show up for Wednesday night youth group each week, eventually we got him to come to Wednesday night youth group too. We looked at him and said, Coach B, if we got to be there on Wednesday nights, you got to be there too. And he came. <laughs> he started finding his place in the pew on Sunday morning with his family about halfway back on the left-hand side. He turned out to be one of the best coaches any team anywhere has ever had. When I was trying to raise money for an overseas school trip, Coach B wrote the largest check. I still remember it. On this Father's Day, it's not an exaggeration to say that he became a father figure to us during some of the most formative years of our lives simply by choosing to be our coach, by choosing to show up. We turned out to have a pretty good basketball team for church league, at least, too. <laughs> a group of undersized boys from the suburbs. Over the years, we found ourselves in more than a few David and Goliath matchups, being the David. <laughs> more times than not, we won. <laughs> I still keep up with lots of the boys, my friends then, now men, from that church league basketball team. Today, there are accountants and lawyers and consultants and small business owners and corporate executives and preachers. They're raising families of their own, like I am, scattered all over the southeast. This morning, they're sitting in church pews all over the country right now. Every single one of them feels exactly like I do about Stuart Von Herkin. 
Can one person willing to show up and be themselves make a difference? <laughs> Surely as God used David, God used Coach B. And the ripples of his influence still spread out along the water decades later. What difference could it make, you say, if you took one intentional step toward thriving this summer? Never underestimate the power of God to work through you. God can use you best when you are faithful to who God created you to be. Just step up and be yourself. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the reminder this morning in David's story that you can use us to do big things, even things that are bigger than we feel like we're prepared for, and even when we feel like we have less than we need. Remind us that the power of your work in the world is your power, not ours. That all you need from us is the willingness to be present, to step up, to be available, to be ourselves, to let you do your work in us and through us. Make that true for each of us this summer. In Jesus' name. Parting him this morning, be strong in the Lord, is printed in your worship guide. I invite you to stand with me as we sing that hymn together. <laughs> Father's Day to all the fathers in the room, and thank you to each of you for being present in worship this morning. Like I remind you every week, I hope all of us leave this hour of worship encouraged and emboldened to be faithful representatives both of this church and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bow with me now for our benediction. Depart now in peace, and as you go, may the God who makes all things holy and whole make you holy and whole put you together spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our Master, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.